free, free forever, I'm free. That sweet grace from the Lord, free, free forever, I'm free. Praise the Lord. Well, here we are, missions on Sunday, number four. It's October 31. Oh, I knew it was a little dark when I come up here, but the lights came on. That must have been the presence of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, crew upstairs. What a sweet time of song and being able to praise him. Every Sunday is a sweet time. We talk about it a lot here. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ every Sunday. It's like Resurrection Sunday every day because it's the first day of the week every Sunday. That's what it ought to be. Even when you wake up first thing in the morning and say, thank you, God, for this day. Let's start afresh and anew this day. Thank you, God. And so in our season of ministry and of missions and how we know that missions and family and sports are our three pieces we center up on as an Acts 1-8 church, this is, again, our fourth and final for the year missions on Sunday. We uh, invoked this, put it in place the beginning of this year. And uh, we had January with Pastor Randy really giving us a tremendous report, keeping missions in front of us on Sunday. Sometimes we know about missions. We look up on some banners. We have an Acts 1A conference, and yeah, that sounds great. We pass out some flyers or pass out a brochure. It has a list of missionaries. Oh, by the way, if you had forgotten, those brochures from the Acts 1A conference have all the missionaries we support. And Pastor Randy covered all that on that fifth Sunday of January. Keep in mind, our calendar comes back up again in 2022. We'll have our next missions on Sunday in January. It has, of course, five Sundays again, so we're looking forward to that. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves because we've already had, again, three of them. In May, Pastor Bobby preached the word and talked about so much of having evangelism and the soul of someone to be on your heart and how we should be more involved in getting out into people's lives. And of course, Pastor Brian preaching on really the call of God on all of our lives and the vocation we're with. We're all called to salvation and to bring in that message of Christ. And here we are, the fifth Sunday of October, fifth Sunday of the last season of the year. I heard that today's Halloween. <laughs> Pumpkins and all that kind of stuff. But it is an opportunity this evening when people come to your house to give them some candies and out in the lobby, if you said, hey, I don't know, what can I do? How can I? Listen, give them a clean heart track when you hand out some candy. Amen? Where are they found? In the lobby, on a table, all wrapped up in packages of 10. Please grab a bunch like we did last year, the year before, right in front of the pantry. That's the King's Pantry out there, and it has the Word of God for you to give to people. And so use this Sunday as a place where when people come by your house, say, hey, take a, by the way, don't give them one of those tiny little pieces. Like, Can you believe candy is this small now? Man, that's a, that's a sign that I'm getting really, really old. Because the only size of candy when I was growing up, you had the big thing, the bar, don't you know, the bar, the candy, Yeah. I used to, how about the big ones, the real gigantos, you know? That's, I used to go to my relatives and they'd get one of them big guys, you know? Not anymore. Those cost like $14, don't they, or something like that? You, you can't pay your mortgage for a month if you gave those out to the kids. But I promise you, if you did, they would really listen to you. And they would listen to what you have to give them. And that's the treat of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, that's what this weekend has been about. And every weekend should be about that. And our special family field day yesterday, what a time we had. Thank you, God, for God's people jumping in. Thank you, God, for God's people. What a day. We praise God. And I thank all of you for being part of that. Though those of you who couldn't be out there were praying, thank you. We had a great time. We were able to give away a lifeboat. And uh, Aaron's going to speak of that in a little bit. A young girl got saved yesterday, came up and asked for, the, for a New Testament. There were some other kids that we believe really prayed to receive Christ. And, and maybe one day we'll find out. And that was exciting. And the beautiful part about it was God just kind of orchestrated things the way he always does. But the beautiful part was we responded to God's orchestration. 
and the team that came in, and, and uh, we had Center Shot Ministries here last year, and they've come back again, and we're going to make it a, a yearly thing and, and continue to have them coming back as missionaries with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only difference between them and old Apostle Paul is they use a big old 30-foot trailer instead of a 30-foot boat. And so, so, yeah, they've been traveling around the countryside bringing the gospel to people through center shot ministries and other different things that God's led them to do. And as Aaron says, and he said with him and Dan, they kind of just, eh, we just travel around looking for what God's going to do, run to where God's at work, join in, and have an incredible time by the word and by the spirit of God. So we thought with our missions on Sunday, it would be the right time to have old Aaron come and preach to us. Aaron and Dan, again, from Center Shot. Dan's over speaking for our youth group. Uh, and also, too, I heard the, the Sunday group that meets in second hour, they're over there joining as well. So that's a sweet time. So we thank you, God. Aaron has a great background in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing he would say is great about him, but the Lord Jesus Christ, great grace, great power, and a sweet testimony of the Lord and a tremendous preacher of the Word of God. Come give us the Word of God. Aaron, Pastor Aaron, thanks. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. It is so good to be here. You know, Dan and I were talking this morning. We don't get to go to places like this ever. I mean, there's some great churches we get to go to, but you guys have loved us so incredibly well. I mean, our, there's three of us that work on staff and Dan is here. Mark got to come last year. Mark's at home. I know he's going to be watching. He's like, man, I wish it was there. But he's got to keep everything running so we can come out and do this. So we're thankful for Mark. And it's just so good to have a great team. And you guys, as we've come here, we feel like your family. You've loved on us and poured into us. And just that strengthens us to keep going out and doing what we're doing. So just so grateful for you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to share a little bit of my story with you, and uh, it's uh, kind of uh, it's special to be here because there's a number of people here that were part of my story early on, and uh, it's good to be back with them. So, you know, this title is called Follow Me, and uh, those two little words were the two words as I grew up in the mountains of Colorado they, those two words were the, about the, that's about as much scripture as I was given. I had this little verse that my aunt put on a card one time for my birthday that said, Matthew 4, 19, you know, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. But the word of God is powerful. And that seed that was planted, that little, those two little words are basically all I remembered. Because I think it connected to me because I grew up in the outdoors. This is a place in Colorado, where I spent a lot of time growing up, there's not a lot of people there, but God found a way to plant a seed. And that little seed, follow me. I knew there was an open invitation. Jesus was giving me that invitation. I didn't know what it meant. I just knew he was inviting me in. Well, my whole life went on, and I was... Um, probably ninth grade, my family moved back to Wisconsin. And in Wisconsin, there's no more mountains. There's a lot of water, though. So this is my little son, Max. He's 12 now. But this is when we moved to Wisconsin. And I loved to fish. And I started fishing a lot. And I started really traveling around and just loved being outdoors. And I had this great girlfriend, Jennifer. And she was a hard worker. She got a degree. She became an accountant. And it was so fantastic. She made all the money, and I spent it all fishing. I thought, this is great. So I would go on these tournaments, and Jennifer says, you know, it's winter. I want to go someplace warm. And I said, you know what? As long as we can stop and I can fish a tournament, we can go wherever you want. She's like, really? You got to fish a tournament? And I said, well, we got to walk on the water half the year in Wisconsin because it's frozen. So this little statement right here, follow me and I will make you into something. That one trip, that story, that was that invitation starting to becoming real. We go on this vacation 
And on the way home, we go through this town called Decatur, Alabama. And we're driving through the town, honest, first thing Jennifer said, I could never live here. That's what she said. And I go, well, we don't have to live here. We're just fishing here for tomorrow. You can, uh, we'll get a nice hotel room. You can have the pool, and I'm going to go fishing. She's like, okay. So I go fishing that morning. I'm at the ramp. It's 4 a.m. I'm putting all my rods and reels together, and this gentleman walks up to me, and he says, you're not from around here, are you? I guess I was sticking out a little odd. Everybody's pulling in there with their boats, and I'm going to be a non-boater and jump in with somebody just so I can go fishing. Well, he starts giving me, like, these baits, and he says, do you have any of these? Do you, if you go and, and your boater asks you where you want to go fish, tell him you want to go here and use these baits. And I'm thinking, aren't we? I, I'm competing against you, right? Didn't matter. I guess he wasn't that worried about me, <laughs> you know, really. But he stepped in in that moment, and he started to help me. That day, I weighed in the largest amount of fish I've ever weighed in in my life in any tournament. And I thought, this place is amazing. Well, I thought I was going to win the tournament. Nope. Phil, that guy that helped me, he won the tournament. <laughs> like he wins a bunch of them. But he said, wow. I was fourth or fifth, I don't even know, somewhere in there, and I thought, oh my goodness, this is amazing. And I, I, he, he just couldn't believe I did that well. And I said, well, I just did what you told me to do. He said, well, I guess it worked pretty good. Well, I took my check, and I went over to the hotel, and I said, Jennifer, look, I want to be a professional bass fisherman. She said, that's barely enough gas money to get home. <laughs> but it's a start. I said, okay. So... We go home, and for two years, I don't know this, but Phil's praying for me. I live 850 miles away, and he's praying for me. And then he's calling me up, and he's saying, Hey, Aaron, you going to fish that one tournament over here or over there? And I'm driving all around the country, and I go to these tournaments, and some of them I knew Phil was going to be there, and some of them I didn't. And I'd walk out of my hotel room, and guess who walks out in the room next door? Phil. And then we start to connect. For two years, that kept happening. And I just think I got this awesome fishing buddy, and he's really good, and I want to learn from him. Well, we're at a national championship, and he wins a boat. And he's up there giving this speech, and he says, I want to give credit to my good friend Aaron from Wisconsin. He showed me some things and taught me how to do something. And I'm like, oh, I did? Well, I'm pretty. <laughs> I didn't think I was that good. I wasn't. He was just believing in me more than even I did. So, first service, yeah, they snuck this picture in. This was not part of the slides. I don't fish very much anymore, but I shoot a lot of archery, and this year I won a national championship in archery. And it's so funny because I don't shoot to chase the dream of being a national champion. I shoot to meet people, and God lifts me up and gives me influence. So Dwayne, he snuck that in there on me. I didn't know that was going to be in there. But this is my family. This is one of those first places where as I was, you know, kind of backing up, Phil stayed in touch with me for two years, and he says, you know, you need to move to Decatur. So I moved to Decatur with Jennifer, who she said she'd never lived there. That was a God thing. And for two years, we started to get in, involved in church and we started to get going and there was some things happening in our life. In my family, this is my prized possession here, Jennifer and then Emma and then Anna and then Jake and Max. So they've grown up a little bit. Here's what's pretty incredible. There was two major parts of tension in my life when I moved to Alabama. One, Phil invited me to church for the first time. I went to church pretty much in my whole life. And I started to see this thing happen in my heart. There was a tension growing because that's the first time the Word of God was starting to be preached to me and taught to me. And I started feeling this tension. I started seeing my sin 
I started seeing my separation from God, and it was wearing me out my hands. I remember holding onto the pews, and it's like I would break into a, I just, I knew God was like talking to me directly. Well, I give my life to Christ a few months after moving. We, start, we try to start a family, and for two years, we can't start a family. We're praying and praying. God is good, amen? Yeah, he is. So, here this follow me starts to come real in my life. You know, Phil was my fishing buddy. He prayed for, for me for two years, and he invited me down. We get to Alabama. Jennifer and I are newlyweds. We're starting to go to church, and he says, hey, I want to disciple you. I want to, I want to start investing in you. And I'm just struggling with that because... One of the things that pushed me away from church was I would see people say one thing and do another. And I said, I can't do that. I'm not, I can't say I'm this Christian and, and I'm learning all this stuff because I know I'm not right with God. There's something in me that's separating and I know it and I don't know what to do with it. And Phil says, that's okay. First lesson of discipleship is salvation. We're going to talk about that. So I start to step into what does it mean? Why did Christ have to die for me? I didn't have anything against him, and I couldn't figure out why. But then it began very clear. My sin was separating me, and he came on my behalf. While I was yet in my sin, he, Christ died for me. And it just transformed my life, the weight of that. So first night, I received Christ. And then a year starts to go where Phil's pouring into me and teaching me how to use rightly divide the word and learn that and I'm going to church and getting involved and I was such good soil I was being built much like this church you know Dan and I we were having a conversation this morning we're just blown away if I lived in this community and this place existed would you please come tell me this is a beautiful place this is not normal you guys have a beautiful family, and you love richly. And there's people just like me that need someone to pray for them. Look at this. Luke 9, 23 and 25. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus is talking to the disciples. This verse came across my life. And I had some major tension going on because I was setting out to be this professional bass fisherman. I worked at a boat dealership and I had all these sponsors. And then I just can't bear my sin and I turn my life over to Christ. And now I'm this new creation. I'm getting involved in the Word and I'm seeing my whole life that I had made before was it was my God, and now God is my God. What do I do with this? That was a huge part of tension in my life. And it got to the point where I said, okay, I walked away from all of it. I laid it down. Phil said, you know, Aaron, if God wants you to have that, he'll put it back in your hand. Just open up. Just lay it down. So I laid it aside, and then I remember the weeks started going by. And I'm praying and I'm saying, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And Jennifer's saying, what are you going to do? You better find out something to do. We, we're not going to make it. Well, I said, Lord, if you'll just tell me, I'll do it. Just tell me what you want me to do. I'm all yours. So I'm in the Word and I'm just learning how to read and start. And I'm beginning to see this Word is alive, it's active. And I'm reading at this time through Ezekiel. And I'm like, just head spinning. I don't even know. I'm brand new, right? But I'm just digging in. I had been through probably enough time to get through the New Testament. And I was, but I was devouring it. I was so hungry for the Word. But I didn't even know what a lot of it meant. And I just knew I just was going to stick with it. And all of a sudden, that day, when I'm up against the wall... And I'm like, Lord, I need to know. What is it? Just tell me. I pray that prayer. I open up my daily reading, and I'm in Ezekiel chapter 4. 
Verse 1, Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile and lay it before thee. And I'm like, it jumped off the page. I got a little bit of a construction background, and I said, tile? Are you saying you want me to be a tile layer, Lord? Hmm. Couldn't get it out of my head. Finished reading. Ten minutes after I'm done with my quiet time, phone rings. It's our custodian at the church. Hey, Aaron, what are you doing right now? I'm like, nothing. He says, you're not working, right? Yeah. He goes, I got some tile that needs to be laid. Can you lay tile? I said, I'm in the tile business. He's like, since when? Ten minutes ago. <laughs> and it started from there, and that whole seven years of that business grew and never advertised one time. All these people God would bring me, and that's where God taught me how to do ministry. He said, Aaron, I want you. I'd go to work every day, and I'm on my knees laying tile, right? And God all of a sudden starts to say, Aaron, I'm going to teach you something. If you follow me, I'm going to make you into something. I'm going to teach you how to do ministry. Ministry is a lot like laying tile. You're on your knees a lot. It's one at a time, and it can be messy. And as that simple thing started to happen, I started to work. God was bringing me all of this work and I was needing more and more people, and there were people down and out, didn't have jobs, looking, they were just in rough shape, just wherever they came from, I would take them. You work with me, I'll teach you how we do tile, and we're on our knees together every day. And I said, you know, we're on our knees, is there anything I can pray for you about? We're on our knees all day. And then we start seeing guys come to Christ, we start discipling. We'd go, whenever we'd be waiting on a job, we'd be having some food, snack, something, somewhere, sharing a meal, talking about Christ, getting in the Word. Five major crews came out of that, and those businesses now are going. I've turned that over, and they do that now. God showed me how to make disciples just by laying tile. But it all started with me saying, I've got to deny myself. And really, it was just a matter of opening my hands and saying, Lord, I trust that what you're going to put in here is better than anything I can go grab a hold of. It's better to just go through life, open hands, letting him take in and put out as he sees, because he has a plan for each of us. He has a mission that he's invited us into. And he's doing a good work in us. It is so freeing to just say, I know what you have for me is best. So now I get to go around doing something that I absolutely love, that I'm totally, perfectly fit for, that God has just given me the desires of my heart, and I can't get enough of it. It is so amazing. Never could have figured that or made that or dreamed that role up, and here I get to do this. He's so good. So we look at this. Take up his cross daily and follow me, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. That's what I was trying to do. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? You know, that last part, I don't really think that's the reason it's jumping out is not necessarily for you in here. It, it may be, but I think more of it is the community around us. The people who are just chasing things, they want to be, belong to something, mean something, be important, be somebody, and Jesus is like, I will make you into something you cannot even imagine. Just let me, trust me. They are out there chasing things. You know, it says cast away. When I think of that, I think of just fishing, fishing. I can go out on a lake, and I can cast for eight hours straight and not catch anything and just keep casting. I love it. I just keep casting. But what a waste. What a waste of time. Well, a lot of the things we chase, they're just wasting our time. They're distractions. And a lot of the people that we're trying to connect with, they're getting tired of chasing things that don't matter. What you have here matters. 
This is the body of Christ that is growing up people, loving people. The community you have is amazing. Now you have this salt and light thing going on. That's our mission, right? That's the mission, mission Jesus is inviting us into. We're to be salt and light. Not everybody's going to be at that place where they're ready. Dust off your shoes, go to the next. Keep going. There are people all around that are searching. You keep searching for them. And when you find that person on your heart, pray for them. Set a two-year goal. What would happen if there was a two-year goal of saying, okay, Lord, if you can bring a guy 850 miles away and move him all the way to, from Green Bay to Decatur and he gets saved and his whole family transforms and everything, could you do maybe move somebody down the street into this place? Yeah, he's able. And he, can, and he wants to do it through you. So now we move to Acts. A little different follow me. The first were t- two follow me's were from Jesus. This follow me is a little different. Here in this place, the disciples are kind of going out starting the ministry and they're going out doing the work and they're, they're starting to pay for it. James has just been killed and now Peter's in prison and Herod is, is after him. And watch what happens in this story with Peter. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Prayer starts, right? On your knees. Finding that burden. Ask for that tension. Lord, who is it that I'm having a burden for? Praying for them. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains. Now there's one of two things here. Either we're asleep, or the people we're trying to reach are asleep. Now, I don't necessarily think that you're asleep. There's some beautiful things going here, but you might be. That's a question for you. But I know there are people asleep in their bondage all around you. That I know for sure. But see, when we start to pray as a body, as individuals, and we start to pray, something steps in. What steps in? And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Jesus invites us in to a mission. And he is looking to redeem and restore those that are in bondage. And we can testify that he has done that for us. And we can share with others that he will do it for them. You guys know that, right? You guys know that. But we get distracted. We look and we go and we get started and there's some pushback and there's some things that come against it. So we back off. How do we work through? Our whole culture right now is filled with tension. You may have tension at home. You may have tension in work. You may have tension in your neighborhoods. There's tension in every community in the country right now. What do we do with that? And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, Peter, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. Well, it's interesting. When you think about putting on the armor of God, gird thyself with truth, the word of truth, and bind on thy sandals. That's shod with the gospel of peace. There's two things at work here. There's the word of truth and the gospel of peace. The Holy Spirit is wanting to work through the word of truth and the gospel of peace. And Peter now is going, okay, I'm going to go forth. I'm going to do this. And he said unto him, cast thy garment about thee, Peter. Let's go and follow me. Are you following the Holy Spirit and doing what he wants to do in your community? It's going to mean that you're getting in the word and that you're going out and exercising what you're seeing what you're hearing, what you're sensing, what the Spirit wants to guide you in. Are you stepping into it? Well, that's where the tension is. And I keep 
talking about tension. That's the part I think the Lord has put on my heart to share with you. Peter said, once he saw this, he put on the word of truth, he put on the gospel of peace, and he's now going, he said, now I know of a surety. It was a worthy thing to follow after. It was a, he was made sure. He saw it. He said, what just happened to me is a miracle, and now I'm set free. It's a sure thing. So for me, that says to me, Aaron, I want to get into the word of truth and share the gospel of peace, just like Peter. Follow me. Jesus is inviting us to join him on the mission. He is for us. He is for you. So be confident and trust him. That's what's going to have to happen as we step into the tension around us. You know, there's a good way to illustrate this. This is the center shot lifeboat. The center shot life bow is a bow that tells a story. This is what we get to use as we go around the world. We've shared this gospel story. with We're approaching 5,000 people this year alone with this story. And it's really a simple story. You know, the ancient archers, they would go and they would be practicing and shooting, and downrange there'd be a spotter. And that spotter would yell, Mark, if they hit the mark on the target. And they would yell, sin, if they miss the mark. That's where it comes from. It's an archery term. It just simply means to miss the mark. And all of us know that we don't hit a bullseye every day. You have to receive Christ to have that sin paid for. That's the only way. That sin separates us. So these top limbs, they're separated as a picture of how our sin separates us from God. He is perfect and holy, and we are not. But God says, I'm going to make a way. See, in a bow, the most important part of a bow is this red part. This red part right here, it has a rest on it. But this bow, this red part is called the riser. And the riser is where all of the strength and forgiveness comes from. Without this riser, you have nothing. There's no way that this can be operational. The riser represents another riser who rose on the third day. This riser represents Jesus. And you'll notice that anything that touches the riser turns white as snow. There's forgiveness when we receive the riser. Now, being a national champion, now that I have some credentials, I can tell you when you're shooting a bow, there's, there's an incorrect way and that's when you try to grip the riser and you try to control it. See, the beautiful thing about shooting a bow is this relationship between you and the riser, only you and the riser, no one else can hold this for you, it's only between you and the riser, and it is simply by faith. You just have to relax I can't even do it with just, I, I have to relax and just receive the riser and draw him to me. I just have, the only way that I can shoot correctly is by just receiving the riser and drawing it to me. Then I don't interfere with what the riser is meant to do. Now, this story continues on. I receive the riser my sins are forgiven, and now the blue limbs represent being baptized. It's the next step. The first step of being obedient to the riser, to Christ, is I want to die to my old self and live for you. Here you go. I'm opening my hands to just trust what you will put in it. This green cam, this is a compounding cam. This is a compound bow. The green represents growth. When you open your heart to grow, in the Word of God, there's a compounding factor that comes into your life, and it adds strength which you did not have. It adds strength to you. And then you have the string. The string is the yellow and blue part that's intertwined, and it represents the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. 
And as you draw that to you, and that becomes part of your life, you find your home in heaven on the streets of gold. This is a round wheel. It never ends, just like our life with Christ. That's a pretty amazing story, isn't it? So when we talk about that, what I feel like the Lord has put on my heart to share with you specifically is this idea of tension. Remember the string? The string is the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. It's like diet and exercise. You can't have one without the other. They've got to work together. I've got to have a healthy diet of the Word of God, but I've got to be able to exercise where the Spirit is leading me and guiding me and step into that and be in step with the Spirit, right? It's a balance. But here's what happens in our Christian walk. We receive the riser, and then we at times are asked and the Spirit is prompting us, but we start to pull and we feel this tension and it's growing and it's growing. It's like, I, I don't know if I can go there. I don't know if I can trust that. And then we try it again and that tension's growing, growing. It's like, oh, it's just too much. I, don't, I, I, I tell you what, I love Jesus. And I'm going to be someone who just says, I love Jesus. I'm just having a hard time trusting him with the rest of I'm not really launching anything. There's not really any of this, this growth. I, I just I start drawing and stepping in, and it's just too much. If I was an archer, and this was my bow, and I never pulled it back, would I shoot? Would I launch any arrows? It'd be kind of a missing the point. Now, it's wonderful to be part of Christ's family. And there's beautiful things. But God has a unique way of bringing tension into our life even when we don't want it, right? He does that because he loves us. And he knows that we will be made stronger. So what we can do is we can say, how about we just step into the tension and invite the Word of God and the Holy Spirit right there with us and see what happens then. So now, as I'm beginning to launch arrows, the unique thing is sometimes... The, sometimes we feel like we're going backwards as we're growing. Well, guess what? An arrow has to move backwards before it can be launched forward. So we just need to relax and keep trusting the riser. Keep aiming at the right things. Step into that tension. So you may have tension in your family that's got you paralyzed from going out and talking to people around you. You may have tension at work. You may have tension in your neighborhood. Step into it. Invite the Holy Spirit and the Word of God into it. He wants to do a work through that tension. And as you begin to build your form and your strength, and as that tension, pretty soon you begin to see, oh, more tension? Oh, God's going to do something here. He is worthy. It is a sure thing, as Peter said. He will be there with you in your tension. See, the enemy tells us, we know he just lies. But every one of us, we're writing a story in our mind. We're writing a story of what we think is true. That's why we need to hear from Jesus. He's calling right now. When we write those stories in our mind, if we don't have the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, we get easily tricked into believing a lie. Before you know Christ, like our community out here and a lot of them that don't know Christ, they're believing a lie. This is, you're good, you're good, you don't need a church, God, Jesus, you're good, don't worry about it. That's the lie. When you come to Christ, the enemy changes his story, he changes his lie. And he says, look at what's going on in your life. You're no good. Christ can't work through you. That's tension. Step into it. Invite the Word of God into that. Invite the Holy Spirit into that. Get your body of believers around you and say, pray for me because I'm going through stuff that I don't want to be paralyzed with. I don't want to be handcuffed with. Let's get rid of it and let's get on to the mission. So it's simple bow. tells a pretty powerful story because it's rooted in the Word of God. So the foundation comes from the Word. 
but we have to have that balance of now living it out. So the next few minutes, what I'd love to do is really just get honest about your, your tension. When I go back and look at all the amazing people God brought into my life, it was to help me work through tension. It was, it was real tension for me at the time. You are the people God is working through to solve the tension that's around you. He wants to work through you. Now, you can ignore the tension, but you'd be like an archer walking around that never put an arrow in and never pulled back the bow. Or you can say, Jesus, I'm going to join you on your mission, and I'm going to engage in the tension. So it starts with you first, just like everything does. Starts right where your life is, where your family is, but then look for the tension that's right near you, outside your walls. That's what we want to do for the next few minutes, is just take some time, pray, and say, what's the tension I need to deal with? Because there's an opportunity coming. He wants to launch you into something great. And then let's pray, where is there tension around me? Who are the people that I need to start praying for that are going through some tension that I can step into and join them in that mess for right now? So let's pray. Oh, Father, we're so grateful for your presence. We're so grateful for your grace, how you love us, and how you take the things that are going on in our life that we see that maybe seem for bad, but you turn them for good. That's what you do. You're a redeemer and a restorer, Father. So right now, Father, we're stepping into the tension. Where is there tension that we need to get you involved in? That we've been maybe running from and calling it good? Eh, that's good. I don't need to deal with this. I'm just going to ignore it. No. It's time to address it. Father, we know you will take that and turn it for good. You will do amazing things. And we ask you right now, Father, to clear up that tension in our lives so that we can be effective salt and light in the people around us. Show us where that tension is, that we can go to the prayer room on their behalf, just like somebody did on our behalf. So in a moment, Brownie's going to come. But let's work through that tension. Let's draw into it. Holy Spirit, would you meet us there? In Jesus' name, amen.